I am delighted to be joined today by two colleagues who will be discussing international development. And the two are the best to be discussing this because within the School of Foreign Service, they are really leading our efforts um, of thinking about and preparing our practitioners and scholars for the international development field. The first is Dr. Steve Radlett. He is the Donald F. McHenry Chair in Global Human Development. He's a distinguished professor of the practice and he directs the Global Human Development Program. He serves as an economic advisor to President Ellen Johnson Sirleaf of Liberia and is a non-resident fellow at the Brookings Institution. Previously, he served as the chief economist of USAID and a senior advisor for development for the Secretary of State Hillary Clinton. He has a long and distinguished um, uh, career in international development and is leading our efforts at the Global Human Development Program. Dr. Erwin Tiangsen, also leading the program as the Deputy Director of the Global Human Development Program and a professor of the practice. Previously, he served as a senior economist at the World Bank and served in the Europe and Central Asia region and more recently in Latin America and the Caribbean region. He's also worked at the International Monetary Fund and served as an associate professor at the Asian Institute of Management where he remains a non-resident fellow. I'm delighted to have both of them, um, experts and practitioners and scholars in this area. So thank you both for being here. Let me start with just a question, if we can think back to a time where there was not COVID or we were not aware of it yet, and just think about what the development world looked like at that point. What were the development challenges and opportunities that existed pre-COVID? Um, and what was the international community facing in advance of this time with the pandemic? I think the biggest challenge then was just getting students ready for normal final exams, I, I, I guess, uh, as we think back, <laughs> at least in an academic environment. But um, uh, seriously, there, obviously there are some big challenges and they may they uh, remain with us. Up over the last 25 or 30 years, there has actually been extraordinary progress in fighting global poverty and uh, progress within what we call developing countries. Uh, the global poverty numbers fell from around uh, 2 billion people in 1990, down to about 700 million a couple of years ago, a drop of 1.3 billion people, absolutely unprecedented in world history. We had a, a drop in the uh, mortality rate, the under five mortality rate, the share of children that die before their fifth birthday from around uh, over 20%, if you can imagine, if you can imagine, over 20% of children dying before the age of five in 1960. Um, down from 20% to about 4%. And I actually think that's one of the greatest achievements in human history. And every single country in the world, every single country in the world uh, had a fall, had a drop in the infant mortality rate. And I'm not gonna say except, because there are no exceptions. And I don't know of anything ever that's happened like that. Uh, more girls are in school, uh, income levels are up, uh, democracy had been spreading, although a setback in the last few years, and on and on. There'd been this great success. But even before COVID, there were question marks as to whether it would be sustained, and, and th there are many, but the two big ones were on climate change, uh, of course, um, where the world's poorest countries, which um, had the least to do with creating the problem, um, really uh, could bear the brunt of it, and particularly fragile states um, that are semi-arid uh, along the Sahel and Sub-Saharan Africa, or um, countries like Bangladesh prone to flooding and other kinds of, 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 of problems. Uh, so global warming, absolutely uh, the number one risk. And, and close behind it, the other big risk was the recession in democracy uh, and um, where many countries had moved towards adhering to uh, greater human rights and a stronger voice uh, for all people and electing their leaders and holding them accountable. And with that, good governance had, had, had uh, come a, a wide range of social and economic improvements. In some countries, not in all, but in a, in a fairly significant number of countries, there had been a, a backtracking in democracy and a movement towards dictatorship. And that, that movement, I think, was really in the balance of what the uh, of whether uh, there would be a global movement towards democracy and, and, and adherence to rights or, or move back to autocracy. And so those two issues are still, I think, um, uh, out there and are well, they definitely are out there and are huge. And the third, which is now obvious, is pandemic disease. And that risk had been there before because of, of the number of antibiotic drugs that had begun to lose uh, their resistance. We saw other diseases like Ebola and SARS that had begun to spread. And so 
uh, people in, in the health field had, had, had said for a while that there's been a, that there's a real risk of some kind of a pandemic. And so uh, here we have it. So that risk was there before and uh, it's with us now. And even when we get past COVID, will remain in other kinds of diseases that we don't have uh, the wherewithal to, to fully fight. Excellent. Thank you, Steve, for painting that picture of, of what existed before. And we will actually be spending in this series um, a couple weeks looking specifically at democracy as well as, as the issue of climate change as well. Um, Irwin, let me turn to you. How has the pandemic then impacted the progress that was being made? Are there areas where um, that have been more readily addressed because of COVID or are most areas been negatively impacted as the world has turned its attention to COVID? Um, it's, it's changed quite a bit. First of all, thank you for inviting us uh, to this conversation. Uh, uh, happy to share with you some of what I know, uh, some of the things I continue to, to think about and, and, and so many things I don't really understand. So maybe later in this conversation, instead of offering answers, which I certainly don't have, let me offer instead a way to think about some of these issues, uh, a, a way to organize incredible amounts of data and information that we receive on a day-to-day -day basis. On the question of, of how have things changed, um, what areas, what regions have been uh, deeply impacted. Uh, I want to say first something uh, in addition to what Steve said. Uh, Steve described what the environment looked like just before COVID. And, and it's exactly uh, how he described it. In fact, he wrote a book about it. So I have nothing more to add to what he described. All the incredible, amazing gains over the last 25 years, as, as, as he pointed out, uh, from poverty at 2 billion people down to something like 730 million people. Uh, to that, I'd like to add, though, that uh, the remaining uh, you know, extreme poverty all over the world, uh, what we knew pre-COVID was that many of them are in fragile and conflict-affected mm -hmm. states, which then meant that it's going to be incredibly difficult to lift the remaining 700 plus million people uh, in extreme poverty, out of poverty, just because of um, the environment, the context. Um, and in my conversations with students as well, just before COVID, they would ask me, um, where are the you know, main development challenges? Where can we contribute? Uh, as we look at our life uh, after GSFS, uh, where do you think the jobs are going to come from? That's another way of asking the question, right? And I remember directing them to a particular practice area that at the World Bank is referred to as fragility, conflict, and violence, or FCV. Um, and and, and there's the, the needs there are great, and they need, they, they need people, they continue to need people. And just before COVID-19, before the lockdown, we actually had a job fair, which is sort of unheard of, an FCV job fair because they were expecting numerous positions to be available and many of our students attended that. Then we had, and some of our students were helping put together an FCV forum or a fragility forum that was supposed to take place March this year. It was supposed to bring together uh, 3,000 practitioners from all over the world. And then they were supposed to meet over a week and have like something like, it's, it was crazy, like 200 sessions. And it's the World Bank working with the UNHCR and so on. Uh, so, so in, incredibly difficult challenges, but also exciting as it brought together all these different organizations that previously didn't work together. They worked in parallel, now working together, collaborating. With the lockdown, then the forum had to be postponed. The mm -hmm. FCV work has slowed down, right? The forum has moved to something online, which also is interesting. I'll, I'll talk about that for a second. So. So all these difficult development challenges, they remain you know, difficult challenges, but some of these things have had to slow down because of, of the pandemic, because of the lockdown, there's been a reallocation of resources, human resources, financial resources, towards supporting uh, countries that have been hit hard by, uh, by the crisis. And if you look at the last uh, poverty projection from the World Bank, here are a, a couple of big headlines. Uh, up to 100 million people might fall into poverty 
because of the pandemic. Now, keep in mind, of course, mm -hmm. these are projections. Uh, our forecasts are often off. Uh, but it tells you the scale of the problem. And some of, some, 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 some of the practitioners who know this best basically characterize this as it's like a reversal of all the gains that Professor Radelet, uh, Steve described. And it's like losing the last five years. That's the impact. And, and in terms of which regions have been hit hardest, uh, some of this you can Google, you can look at you know, where the pandemic has hit hardest, but also it's not, that's not the entire story because it's, it's, it's the combination of the, the crisis as well as the resources that they have to respond to the crisis. In terms of poverty projections, it looks like it's going to be, uh, a lot of it will come from uh, South Asia and Africa. Even though if you just look at the absolute numbers for, uh, for infection, you would think that maybe Africa is not, you know, has, has, not been a, has not been hit hard. Uh, I, 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 you know, like it's not as bad as what's going on in Brazil or India or, or the US. Uh, but it's about the crisis and then the resources and the context and then together uh, huge poverty increases expected, unfortunately, in Africa and South Asia. Sorry, I'm going on and on. I, I just wanted to share those for starters. Excellent. That's very, very helpful. And it's obviously extremely troubling to hear um, that reversal on the heels of the gains, which, uh, which Steve outlined. Steve, let me ask you, um, what systemic failures or challenges has the pandemic revealed both about our health, um, the international community's health response capability, but also our ability to sustain or to hold on to some of the gains specifically in the development um, in the development sphere yeah it's a good question uh, I think let me think, talk about about three things one is the the uh, international ability to respond the second is uh, our inability to invest in um, technologies that can improve health over time and then the third is the revealing the weaknesses in in health systems in, um, in developing countries. So uh, internationally, um, you know, we have a, a system that's been, never been perfect. It's always been uh, flawed, but, but it has been in place and ha has improved in many ways since World War II with the United Nations, with the uh, IMF, the World Bank, set of bilateral uh, agencies, G20, uh, developing countries coming together uh, and different forums and, and, and systems through, through which we can work. It's, this is now, and people have been talking about this for a long time, but this crisis uh, makes it very clear that that system, uh, as much progress as it has helped make, is sorely in need of, of, of change, where the leadership is, is, is not there. And especially at a time when, frankly, we're not getting the leadership from the major Western countries, including the United States, of doing things like dropping out of the World Health Organization right at the time of the biggest uh, global health crisis in, in 100 years. So we have a, a very weak system in terms of how uh, all of us as a global community can react and respond and, and, uh, and assist uh, each other. So that's one big weakness which had been there before um, and, and, and this lays it, it bare. And to strengthen that system, we're gonna have to rethink those institutions, the leadership, the membership of those organizations, how they uh, work together and how we can broaden the leadership, um, not just the top people, but uh, the countries that have a major voice and have more space for Brazil and South Africa and, and, uh, and other major, and Indonesia and other, and Bangladesh and other major countries that really have no voice. So that's, that's one second and more particular, and this has to do with both health and on climate change. Uh, I believe that, um, uh, that if we're gonna continue to make progress in developing countries, one, not the whole story, but one piece of this will be to continue to develop the kinds of technologies that um, that help people in poor countries, uh, uh, vaccines, medicines, but also uh, on, on the uh, climate change side, uh, drought resistant seeds, heat resistant seeds, those kinds of things. And we do not have good mechanisms for uh, funding and developing those kinds of technologies that can be so crucially important to poor people. We have good systems that develop technologies that are helpful to rich people. Um, uh, you know, whether it's, uh, uh, you know, some of the, the solar panels and green uh, power uh, or some of the health stuff that is that caters to richer people, but not so, so much for 
poor people. And so when, uh, when we look at things like Ebola not, and SARS, not to mention, um, uh, not to mention COVID, we really don't have a system that can help develop those kinds of technologies. And I think we really have to rethink that in a, in a major way. But the third thing that this reveals, the third weakness this reveals is that for all the progress that's been made in developing countries, uh, the institutions are still weak, the, the capacity and capability are still weak. And um, building those takes, um, takes focused effort and it takes many years and generations. And international aid programs are not are not built, uh, are, are not focused on building that capacity in those systems. Um, mm -hmm. And in particular in health, they're not. Uh, PEPFAR, the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief, uh, along with the Global Fund for AIDS, TB, and Malaria, are two great programs that have really helped uh, the fight uh, against HIV, but they don't build health systems. And it's a real flaw. What they do is they help purchase antiretrovirals for people that save lives, no question about it. Uh, 18 million or more lives have been saved by this, but the money goes into buying drugs and getting the drugs out to people who need it, which is really important, but not to build the underlying health systems of the clinics, the physicians, the nurses, the community health workers, and other kinds of things. And, and uh, donors don't like to fund building capacity because it's harder to measure progress, it's harder to claim results. Uh, I think it's a real flaw in our monitoring and evaluation, our push for results. When you push hard for results, which is really important, you tend to measure things that are, you tend to do things that are the easiest to measure. Uh, and you tend to not do things that are harder to measure and harder to achieve. And with building that, those fundamental institutions and building that capacity is at the core of long-term sustained development. And we do not do it uh, very well. And so when there is a crisis like this, whether it's a health crisis, a financial crisis, a climate crisis, it, um, it really does reveal the weakness in the resilience of the institutions and capacity. Capacity is much better than it was 20 or 30 years ago, but it's, it's uh, not nearly as strong as it should be and it has not been a focus of attention. Can I just add uh, in terms Please. of this wasn't the focus of attention. Um, I was just reading a page uh, uh, on the World Bank's uh, website. Uh, they have a, a page for each important development theme let's say poverty or inequality or health. Let's look at their health page. And, and interestingly, it, this hasn't been updated since uh, early April this year, right? Mm -hmm. And so there's a statement there as to what they think is uh, the main challenge in the health sector. So they provide an overview of what the, the key issues are in, in health. And amazingly, um, the first one uh, they, they named was universal health care. Which, which I'm all for, right? So we want to make uh, uh, health services and health resources more accessible. So then it's creating the conditions so that you know, everybody uh, uh, is covered. Uh, but the second thing that they, that they named was lifestyle diseases. So non-communicable diseases. It's about uh, you know, rising rates of uh, obesity, uh, high blood pressure, and so on. And I fully agree these are, you know, very important development challenges. Up until then, something like 70% of deaths uh, all over the world, I think, are due to non-communicable diseases. But compare that with where we are now and what we think the development challenges are and what we were doing you know, up until the lockdown and what we were prioritizing. Now, of the two, I would say, and this is probably true across the different global practice areas, uh, universal healthcare was a good idea, right? Because uh, it was needed then, it still is needed now, and especially in the middle of this pandemic. Great to make sure that you know, everybody has uh, access and they have the resources to pay for, to pay for healthcare. But it's just uh, incredible how things uh, have changed quite a bit in how our priorities have changed and must change as a result of this. But just to add to what you said. Thank you for that. Um, so what I hear from both of those comments is that we have a weak global infrastructure that is now suffering from a lack of leadership. And we have le weak state infrastructure in, in developing countries and a need for technology, which tells me a need for resources and thinking and leadership on that. So we have, a, we have a structural problem from the top and at the state level. Where does the impetus 
for, um, for progress then come from? If, if it's neither, if there's weakness at the state and a weakness at the global system and the individual states that could potentially individually drive progress um, are stepping back, where does that impetus for the, uh, come from that we need to make progress, both, both on, on COVID, but across the board on these issues which you name that were progressing, but now seem to, to be um, regressing to some extent, or at least stagnating? Well, if I may, I the, the key, can... right, the key, the, the, we'll both, I'm sure, comment it. The, the key for leadership on any issue in developing countries is people in developing countries themselves. It's there, it's the, it's the, that's where the core always has to be of starting with, with um, the leadership uh, and the people of the countries themselves and the decisions that are made there, the, the governance structures uh, and the leadership there. Um, and that is always the most important. But that has to be coupled with leadership at the global level, especially for something like this um, and climate change uh, again, um, which is out of their control and, 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 and is much bigger than what happens in, in, within their borders. Countries have the responsibility, obviously, to take the actions that they can take. The leadership has the responsibility to do that. In some countries, that's working well. In other countries, it's not. But at the same time, we also need strong global leadership. And that has to come from a variety of places. It has to come from the, from the G20, which, of course, involves both uh, richer countries and also uh, middle-income and lower-income countries. It has to come from, uh, from individual um, countries like the United States, um, uh, you know, which continues to have uh, uh, a huge and in some ways unique global leadership position and has mm -hmm. failed in that leadership uh, in, in the last few years, has to come from other world leaders that get together and push this as a high priority. And we know from other, um, uh, other issues, debt relief 20 years ago, the movement to fight against HIV AIDS and malaria and TB, that when global leadership does focus on important issues, it can move forward. So you need, uh, you need the impetus at both levels. You need the global impetus, but you need the leadership at developing countries. And that was the case for all this progress over the last 25 years. The key was really a change in leadership within developing countries. A lot of the old dictators from the 1970s and 80s uh, went away, a lot of it having to do with the end of the Cold War and uh, with that, the end of apartheid in South Africa. Um, and when you had those, those shifts, in global leadership that gave space for new leadership and stronger leadership within developing countries. And that was the real impetus to a lot of the progress, aided by uh, the international community, which was helpful in that. Um, and I think that is the, the, the same model as we go forward. The leadership has to come from developing countries, but we also need strong global leadership as well. Mm -hmm. I'd, I'd like to add to that. I fully agree with everything that uh, Steve just said. But also like to add that another impetus for this, for better or worse, I think, just because of human nature, and here I'm freelancing, I know nothing about human nature. Um, it's, it's necessity, right, and urgency, right? It's because we're right now in the middle of it that we have to do something. Uh, and on that, I'd like to share an example from another program, from another practice area, that's uh, where there was uh, limited progress in certain areas. Uh, but now, because we find ourselves in the middle of the pandemic, it just makes it more urgent uh, to complete some of these unfinished reforms. So um, I might even have a picture somewhere. Uh, let's see if I can, if you don't mind my sharing the screen. Uh, uh, but let me give a back, just some background. Uh, there is a country that shall remain nameless. And uh, they did all the right things in terms of preparing uh, their social protection system, coming up with a conditional cash transfer system that was patterned after some of the best models in the world. So they had Latin American specialists actually coming in and helping them design it. Uh, they wanted it to be well targeted so that mm -hmm. they're able to go. So all this, these resources go exactly to the intended beneficiaries and to, uh, to reduce leakage and, and, and so on, make it as efficient as possible. They did all the right things up, uh, you know, up until, uh, uh, the lockdown. In fact, uh, there have been evaluations of the system and, and they're saying it's well targeted, it's been able to lift people out of poverty, right? And it's, it's relatively efficient. People criticize it all the time and there are always 
people criticizing social protection programs. But if you believe all the evidence that's been uh, assembled uh, to, to, to look critically at how the, the system performed, it's performed well. Okay, now the crisis hit, the pandemic hit. Now it seems like this is an obvious thing. Use this existing great system to then distribute resources to help protect households. Okay, and now it's also a flexible system so that now that even the middle class are being hit, right? So the middle class can't work and they've lost a lot of income over the last few months, then it's a flexible enough uh, uh, system that you can easily expand it to include uh, you know, new households that will be covered by the system. Can I show you a picture of how it was working uh, in the middle of the pandemic? Um, give me a second. Here's a picture of the people uh, about to receive resources from the government through this system. Uh, here's another picture. Okay, obviously they were distributing resources by giving people you know, checks to cash or ATM cards. And you need to go then to the nearest ATM, line up in the middle of the pandemic, huge risks of being around people. Then having to do this just because the system doesn't yet make use of mobile money and digital transfers. Now, there are good reasons for converting to digital uh, technology and using mobile money and so on, uh, but progress had been slow. Uh, it had been rapid in some fronts, but here it's been slow. And now in the middle of this, then uh, in, in a way, well, we have no choice. We just have to figure this out and find a way to safely provide resources to households and not give them resources at the same time, then creating the conditions that where uh, they put their own health at risk just to be able to get these transfers from government. But it's also exciting because it means there's an opportunity to partner with the private sector that's been doing this, that's been moving towards you know, uh, mobile money and uh, digital transactions and so on over the last few years. So there's an opportunity for the government to maybe partner with the microfinance community so that these resources are then uh, given to households in a safe manner, um, uh, as safe as possible. Uh, just wanted to share that because I think it's, it's an example of other things going on where would have been a good idea to do this anyway. Now that just makes it more urgent and, and necessary because of where we are. Good, and it's a good thing you kept that country anonymous because nobody's going to be able to figure out where the yeah. Kazan city land is from. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> um, let me let me build on that point um, that that you just made, Irwin. Um, what is the role of the private sector in this? Right, the private sector obviously much more nimble, much more technologically forward leaning than many many governments. At the same time, they do not hold the responsibility that a state does or even that the international um, community does as far as the entirety of um, providing for the population or adhering to international norms or any of the other um, state-based structures that we're used to. How do we look at the role of the private sector um, in, in some of these development challenges that, um, that we've been discussing? Uh, so Thank you. So there's good news and bad news, right? So ev the bad news is everyone, everyone's hurting. Uh, uh, governments are hurting, households, people are hurting, and the private sector is hurting as well. And, and so then it's, it really is an extraordinary period. Uh, normally, with, with other crises, uh, we could have turned to countries that are not hurting as much and say, okay, can you help out? Or internally within countries, uh, maybe the government is in a crisis, but the private sector is doing a little better and so on. And maybe there's room to collaborate. In this case, everybody's hurting. At the same time, uh, the private sector has been a source for all sorts of different innovations, right? So what I just described, moving to mobile money and digital payments and so on, what would it take to, uh, to, to make this work and to make it work well? Well, well first of all, uh, you need to create all the enabling, enabling conditions that would allow this to happen, making sure uh, 
that everyone's sufficiently wired so that then these resources don't create winners and losers. And once they receive this, these digital financial resources, that they can actually spend them. So here's what's interesting. Some of the work on that, right? Like uh, if, you, if the government gives a transfer to a household digitally, and so then um, how can they use it? Well, they need to be able to buy things with it even in rural areas, right? Mm -hmm. So all of those things need to change as well. Uh, amazingly, the work on this started five or six years ago in, in a few places around the world. And, and guess what? Uh, they were led by JP Morgan. Mm. Um, and, and, and so I think there's one, there's a role here for the private sector that's been a role for the private sector for the, lo for the longest time, right? Uh, for, for new ways of doing things, for innovation, and, and, and so on. And here I'm going to freelance a bit, and, and feel free to disagree. Uh, but I also think, as I think about development work and how it is evolving and how, how should it evolve, I keep thinking about what parts of the private sector uh, seem to be working well in the middle of the pandemic. Right, mm -hmm. so this is probably not a popular view, and and, and probably uh, I'm, I'm 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 wrong in a big way, but I'm thinking about. Forgive the example, Amazon Fresh. Why is that working well? Uh, DoorDash delivery. Why is that working well? So look at some of the companies mm -hmm. that seem to be doing well in the middle of the pandemic and some of the you know, worst hit places around the world. And then you ask yourself, why is that working? What are the elements of that that, seems to, that that seem to work well, especially in the middle of uh, a crisis like this? So what are some of the elements? One is, uh, these are examples of like uh, decentralized services, right? Who, who's delivering your grocery? Who's delivering the food that you ordered? It's not some central organization. It's actually your neighbor. It's your neighbor signing up to provide this service. So Amazon had enough foresight to think of a service where you don't rely on any one centralized thing, but you rely on everybody, everyone uh, able to help out. So I'm wondering, what does this tell us about development work and how it's changing as well? How, how, do, we be, how do we remain nimble and flexible in the middle of a pandemic when nobody can travel? Well, then development work needs to dis decentralize even more. So, so organizations were already doing that uh, a lot. The World Bank, uh, for example, was doing that with more local staff and more of the work done you know, locally instead of the older model from 20, 30 years ago, people from Washington flying in and out of different places around the world, but create a model whereby the services are not dependent, fully, fully dependent on people from your centralized units, but making sure that it's decentralized enough that you have regional hubs, local hubs that you are able to deliver in an environment like this. Excellent. Those are great lessons for us to learn and draw examples from both the private sector as well as um, developments that have happened in sectors that we never thought could change, but that COVID has, has forced us to change. I want to come back to that in a second, but I want to go back to a point you raised, Steve, specifically. Um, you talked about governance early on and you said that there was a period in which dictators went away in many countries in, in part because of the Cold War. Um, how are we seeing the difference between the type of government and the level of development progress during this COVID pandemic? We've seen obviously a number of countries use the pandemic as a an excuse for cracking down in, in certain areas um, and we've also seen some governments um, do well because they control a great deal of, um, of the public services um, and a great deal of civil society as well. How are we seeing the quality of government or the difference in government um, impacting the development sector? Good question. And there's not an absolutely clear uh, uh, relationship uh, for the reasons that you point out, um, but we have seen many more autocratic governments use this as an excuse to crack down further, whether it's in Belarus with the latest elections or whether it's in Brazil 
uh, or in, in, in many other countries, Brazil, which had been a democracy, but is one of the countries that had shifted back to uh, more of an aut autocratic government. And unfortunately, we are seeing um, people use this as, a, as an excuse for, for a crackdown um, uh, and for trying to avoid uh, responsibility in moving forward. Um, there are some other uh, uh, governments that are not uh, democracies that are um, that are actually trying to to move forward and actually get people to uh, social distance and using that authoritarian streak to kind of command people to do things in Rwanda and in Ethiopia and other places where um, they're kind of commanding people and people are are, are following in step. So you know and. and it's 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 an old uh, story that you know a benign dictatorship or a dictatorship that's actually pushing people to do a good thing a smart thing can actually make some progress of course in the long run what we've seen over the last 20 25 or 30 years is while there are uh, countries that are dictatorships that have done well uh, or, or that are more authoritarian whether it's china rwanda ethiopia that have done well um, there are a lot of dictatorships that do very badly um, and, um, and have done very badly over the last 25, uh, 25 or 30 years. And overall, the countries that have had more democratic governments overall have, have, uh, have, made, more of the, uh, have made more of the progress. Um, in, but in this response to a particular pandemic, it really just does depend on, on, uh, on the leadership. The countries that are more responsive to their citizens are, are moving forward. And if they can can um, can encourage uh, people to to behave, it depends on the leadership of the country. I mean, <laughs> my own country, the United States, it's a great democracy, but the leadership is not showing a good example. It's not uh, demonstrating wearing masks. We have a president who won't wear masks and ridicules people who do, and is not using the pulpit to encourage people to social distance and stay at home and follow norms. Is in fact using that the other way. So um, even in, in, in what we think of as a strong, stronger democracies, if you've got the wrong person in charge, uh, they can lead in the wrong direction. So it, in, in this particular crisis moment, I think it really depends on the individual leaders and whether or not they're taking this seriously uh, or, or whether or not for whatever reasons they don't think it's serious and are leading in the wrong kind of way. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Let me um, ask one final question. I'll start with Erwin, then we'll um, wrap up with Steve. Erwin, you mentioned a number of the opportunities, um, at least as we do analysis of the situation, but what the opportunities are that have come out of COVID. It's forced us to think differently. It's forced us to question things or be nimble in thinking, which um, had been relatively, um, uh, relatively static. Um, what are the opportunities that you see in the development field coming out of this time of new ways of doing things, of new opportunities that are emerging um, out, of, out of this pandemic? Should we get there soon, hopefully? Right. This is great. Thank you. Uh, because I had actually prepared some answers uh, for this interview, and I was hoping you'd ask the right question uh, so that then I could use those answers. Uh, okay. Right. Uh, here's how. Uh, by the so, way, Nicole, you, sorry to interrupt, but I've okay. got to say this, and Nicole will appreciate this, having worked for the federal government. Uh, I have I, I told Erwin that it doesn't matter the question you're asked. Give the answer to the question that you wish that you wanted them to ask. So just give your answer. The one you want, regardless of what the question is. Right, right. There is the most important <laughs> professional development skill that you will hear. Yeah. Yeah. Answer the question with what you want people right. to know. So, so, so here's Erwin, an answer to a different question. What do you question. want us to know? Uh, yes. Uh, actually, it's in response to your question, at least partly. So that's, that's why I, I think this might work great. Um, I don't often have uh, this kind of conversation uh, with my students in class because I teach as, you know, the quantitative methods. Uh, and so we, we don't have enough conversations on what does this mean, meaning the pandemic and the post-pandemic world, what does this mean for development work more generally? But if I were to have a conversation with students now, and, and, and if they were to ask me how, how, how are things changing, where are the new opportunities, and how should we position ourselves, right? What should we be learning now in anticipation of this uh, hopefully post COVID-19 world sometime soon. And I would say here's, there's just enormous amounts of information and there are huge errors, right? Even some of the best organizations, they're, they're getting this wrong. Uh, just mm -hmm. to give you an example, because I had prepared like an example of how we got 
something wrong in a big way. Uh, back in April, before an, a virtual audience of all the economics teams of the world, the IMF said that uh, in 2020, world GDP will fall by 2.5%. That was in April, mid-April. Fast forward to June, they then said, oops, it's not minus 2.5%, it's actually minus 5%. All right, that sounds small, 2.5, but that's world GDP. The world GDP is nearly $100 trillion. So really, we're talking about a $2.5 trillion mistake. That's the entire Indian economy. Okay, so the caveat is we're getting things wrong. So much new information every day. And even the best organizations in the world, they've had to update their priors uh, and so on. So in the middle of it all, what would be a useful framework that one might use to help organize information and data and all the new things coming in. And here's what I propose. Uh, think of three things in development work as a way to organize what's going on. Uh, one is how do we analyze development challenges? How do we implement programs in development? And then three, how do we finance development work? So uh, in brief, the analytics, the operations, if you will, uh, and then the, fi the financing, right? So I use that to help make sense of the world around me and to understand where are the challenges, where are the opportunities? So as an example, uh, let's look at analytics, right? How do we understand the challenges around us? The traditional way of doing that was you conduct a household survey, right? So you talk to households, you do an interview, find out how they're doing, what they're consuming, their income, and so on, right? That's how we do it in pretty much every part of the world. We can't do that now, right? We can't be doing household surveys, going house to house, talking to people, because it just doesn't make sense. But some parts of the world made investments prior to the pandemic. They invested in monitoring systems that then allowed them to conduct mobile phone surveys mm -hmm. in the middle of this pandemic. Now, you, you can't just do this in the middle of it all. You need to have invested in it so that you understand what information you're actually gathering and how representative it is or, or not. There's a book from 2016 written by Andrew Dabalen on what you need to do to make this happen. The, the countries that did that are now able to do that, able to deploy mm -hmm. uh, you know, mobile phone-based surveys so that in the middle of it all, they can tell you what's really going on rather than just projecting. So mm -hmm. South Africa did it. They have this, this survey called NIDS and IDS. It's mobile phone-based and they have real information that's telling them, unfortunately, 3 million people have lost their jobs through the first uh, few months of the year, most of them women. Okay, now what about the rest of the world? Uh, what can they do if they haven't invested in these monitoring systems? They, they can't just do a mobile phone survey now. It's going to be deeply flawed. Then we'll just have to be creative and look at alternative sources of information, such as satellite data or remote sensing data. Now, pre-COVID-19, people use satellite data. So they look at things like how bright night lights are, right? Uh, uh, to give some sense of how well an economy is doing. And primarily it was used to understand unusual economies like the North Korean economy. So in fact, there was a paper from the IMF 2019, how you use nightlight data to understand the North Korean economy. Okay, fast forward 2020, you can't do a mobile phone survey. How do you know how your economy is doing? Maybe you can use satellite data. So some people did exactly that. They looked at nightlight data in India to give a sense of how things are going right now. In the absence of real data, in the absence of traditional data, how is the Indian economy doing? They look at nightlight in India. Now, how, how, how useful is this information? Let me go back to the IMF. Uh, the IMF announced that the Indian economy uh, will experience a recession, just like other parts of the world, uh, this year. This, they said minus 5%. Okay? The people who use nightlight data, they said, actually, it looks more like minus 25%. Now, the, uh, the government of India just announced its most recent GDP numbers. 
uh, year on year through the second quarter. If I remember correctly, it's 23.9% decline. So, I, sorry, that's just one example of how we just need to be creative. Some invested in creative new sources of information. Uh, what about the others who did not invest? Well, we just need to keep looking around and see what else we can do. And maybe they're even better than some of our traditional sources of information. And that's just analytics. So we can also talk about, and I won't, I promise I don't talk too much. We can talk about it in terms of, you know, analytics. I just did that, analytics, operations, and then finance. It's fascinating. Thank you. That's really fascinating. Um, Steve, uh, where would you point to opportunities um, as we're looking forward post-COVID? Well, uh, let me just uh, point really to one, which is this opportunity for countries to really focus on building capacity and building systems and institutions. And um, uh, I hope uh, there's an opportunity, whether it happens or not, but I hope that countries will look at this and see uh, and, and, and say to themselves, we really need to build our health systems, not just uh, a quick response to, um, to a virus, uh, one particular virus, but looking at this relative to HIV, to malaria, to Ebola, to, to uh, non-communicable diseases, which are coming up uh, mm -hmm. in, in many countries, but recognizing that um, there'll be another health crisis sometime in the future, who knows what it will be, and the best way for countries to defend themselves against that and prepare themselves for that is to build those, uh, those systems themselves. So uh, an underlying health system, as I, as, as I say, that has clinics, that has uh, around the country, that has um, uh, community health workers that can report things and can be an advantage and, and, and training those people to build those skills and build that capacity. And I, I think there's a real opportunity here. I think a lot of countries are gonna look at this and say, you know, we were really on our own. Um, yeah, the international community had to develop the vaccine. We in, in Tanzania are not going to develop the vaccine, but we in Tanzania do need to build our health system so that we are resilient to this in the future. And with any luck, that will spill over to other areas as well, to education, to, uh, to agriculture, to other kinds of things. And the opportunity is here for uh, the international community, the donor community, to focus much more on being serious about country ownership and country-led development. And to, for that to be successful, it is about building those systems and building that capacity and building those institutions, not just giving lip service to it as we so often do, but actually building, uh, building in programs that the, that the real focus is on building capacity and building skills. And then, um, and then over time, gradually, you know, moving that responsibility to, to, to local systems. And so there's an opportunity to do that. Uh, I think um, not in the next year or two, but in the next decade or two, I think we're going to see a huge movement in that direction mm -hmm. during the career span, the professional careers of, of our students that are now in the, in, in the School of Foreign Service. I think we're going to see developing countries have more financial resources, their own financial resources at their disposal. Uh, they're going to have far more skilled people. Uh, and so this is an opportunity for us to really shift that focus towards building those long-term institutions and, and systems. Whether we'll take advantage of that opportunity, we'll see. But uh, it does create that opportunity for that kind of advancement. Excellent. So much information. We could probably continue for a couple more hours, but I won't, uh, I won't hold you both. Um, let me just say thank you to Steve Radlett, to Erwin Tiangsen for a really enlightening conversation. Um, and thank you for what you're doing in preparing the next generation of scholars and practitioners who are going to be moving forward on the issues that we discussed today, taking advantage of those opportunities and looking to continue to return to that progress that uh, Steve talked about at the very beginning of our conversation. So thank you to both of you for taking the time, and I look forward to eventually seeing you back on campus. Thank, thank, you. thank you for having us. Yeah, it was really fun to be part of this conversation, so thanks for having us. Fascinating conversation with our two colleagues from the Global Human Development Program. Let me pull a few facts out of our conversation. First, we heard Dr. Radlett talk about the challenges that exist at several levels a weak international system, the lack of consistent leadership, insufficient technology, and insufficient capacity and infrastructure at the state level. 
The question is, how will we attack each of those different problems? And what will be the impetus, the source of uh, change that will be brought in all four of those arenas? Second, we heard both speakers speak about technology and the importance of looking at technological solutions to development problems. Once again, we face a question of where will the innovation come from? Will that come from the private sector, from governments? And how will we ensure that those technological advances are shared widely throughout uh, the developing world and throughout the world to ensure that all groups are able to benefit from those technologies? And then lastly, we heard this uh, question about what opportunities lie ahead and how we think creatively about the analysis, the operations and the financing to look for different opportunities in each of those areas that had not existed before. And the importance of looking at the COVID-19 pandemic as an opportunity to refocus international efforts on building health infrastructures in other countries and ensuring that the next time we have a pandemic or as we deal with daily and normal regular um, health challenges that we have sufficient health infrastructure in countries to enable us to deal with these challenges. A lot of great comments and a lot of great thoughts to, to wrestle with. I look forward to our conversation.